Michael Ramson is not a stranger to you. We've known Michael for a number of years. In fact, Michael, I'd met several years ago, but only in the last couple of years uh, have we begun a, a, a friendship that I've treasured. And a lot of it has to do with who he is, a man of mind and also heart. And if you know me, that it's not just mind or heart that needs to engage with the gospel, but both. And I, I have so been so blessed by walking with Michael, learning from him. He's part of RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. We're a strategic partner, as many of you would know, with RZIM. Michael does not live here. You'll find that out quickly when you hear him speak. He's not from these parts, as we say. He's from Oxford, England. He and his wife, Anne, live there with three precious kids. Michael has a number of hats. He is an, uh, an apologist and a teacher, travels all over the world. Is, it, it consults with various organizations and government groups as well regarding cultural trends. But deeply and foremost, he's a lover and a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. He is the director of the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics that works out of Wycliffe Hall in Oxford that is a voice for credible thinking Christianity in one of the most prestigious universities in the world. It's a short-term apologetics training. They have been overwhelmed with applications. They pick the cream of the crop. We've actually had some folks from here at Woodman who've been accepted in that program. It's a short-term to go back into fields and spheres of influence understanding the legitimacy, the credibility, the cogency of the Christian faith. He's also not only involved with the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, but he's a regional director in terms of his leadership role with RZIM. It's a very small territory that he's over. Uh, it's, it's Europe, Middle East, and Asia. So uh, that takes him about a half a day a week, and the rest of the time he tries to figure out what else to do. But he is been uh, gracious enough to be with us this weekend. He's blessed me deeply. I, I saw early on that his text was the Gospel of John. And leave it to Michael. It took me, what, 60 some odd, 70 messages to cover John. He's going to take care of it in one uh, morning. And, but, and he actually does. Would you tell Michael Ramson that you're glad he's here? I'd like to uh, thank uh, Matt for his very generous introduction and kind words, and also uh, his wife, Arlene, um, who hosted me for an absolutely wonderful meal uh, a couple of days ago. Um, we had an incredible time together. Uh, they, sadly, they invited a few other people too. Um, otherwise, I would have eaten that whole roll of pork all by myself. Um, but it's great to be back here, and it's always a delight to be able to have some time with you. Um, this is always the dangerous service, because this is the one where Matt says to me, this is the last one, nothing's happening after this, so take as much time as you want. So we're going to start reading at the beginning of John, then we'll get to the end of John, and then I'll sort of take you by my blow-by-blow blow account through. Um, we'll finish around Christmas. Um, it's, uh, it'll be a fascinating experience for you. You'll be a lot thinner by the end of it. The, the question that we have before us this day, one God many paths is one, especially in the kind of culture where we live now, that is, is become a pressing one. And I think it, the reason is, is that we are aware of the tensions that we see in our world, and maybe even the tensions that we see in our own hearts. And we're aware of how we struggle and wrestle with various issues. And in a world where so much seems to be driven by hatred and by fear and by violence and so on, we, we just think, well, surely there'll be a way in which we can somehow just simply reach out and just say to everybody, look, everything's going to be okay. You know, and when it comes to areas of belief and conviction and various other ideas and so on, look, just don't hold those too strongly. The main thing is, is that we all just simply try to do the very best that we can. Now, this comes from, I, I suppose, a desire on our behalf to actually try to make a connection with people in such a way as to say, look, everything is, is really the same. And so if you're looking for God, if you're trying to find peace within yourself, or you're looking for some kind of ultimate peace within this world, then just find the path that most suits you. Now the trouble is, is if you begin to push people, most people don't actually believe that. And the trouble is, is that as soon as you begin to say, hey, look, I'm going to take one of these and um, uh, elevate it to a, more high, to a higher standard, you, you find yourself at that point in something very contentious. But I'd, I'd just like to start off by making a simple point, and it's this. 
if someone wants to say, look, all paths lead to God, that's what someone would like to say, they're actually saying that those who believe only some paths lead to God or only one path leads to God are wrong. Now, if you want to say, look, only some paths lead to God, because you're not sure about, for example, Al-Qaeda and the path that they've laid out for salvation, you know, or maybe Adolf Hitler, um, you want to exclude some people and say, no, no, that, that's definitely wrong. If you want to say some paths lead to God, you are saying that those who believe that all paths lead to God or only one path leads to God are wrong. It doesn't matter how you phrase your claim when it comes to how are we going to get to God, at some point, somewhere, you're going to end up excluding someone. I was um, speaking at a, um, a dinner event a few years ago in the United Kingdom. It's been attended by some sort of senior members of the military. And we, at the end of my presentation, I uh, said, are there any questions? And the senior ranking person there uh, asked the first question. And he said, well, here's my question. You seem to be excluding a lot of people. He says, and surely all truth is just simply a matter of perspective. It's just relative to how you look at it. And so I looked at him and I said, well, are you claiming that in an absolute sense? And he said, well, no, 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 that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that surely you cannot be certain. And I said, are you sure of that? <laughs> At this point, he sort of sat back in his chair and he smiled. He said, I seem to have a problem. I said, sir, I think you do. <laughs> now, I understand what he's saying because what he's trying to do is to phrase something in a way as to make it non-confrontational or non-exclusive, but that is very hard to do as soon as you try to claim that anything is true. I was speaking at another dinner in London a few years ago, and uh, someone gave me um, uh, an illustration, which I've, I mean, I've heard many, many times before. And at the end of the talk, he just looked at me and he said, look, Michael, imagine there's this mountain, and there are all these paths that go up to the top of the mountain. And you're on one path, and you're going to the top, and I'm really happy for you. But there are lots of other paths on this mountain, and they all go up to the top, and so, you know, it doesn't matter which path you're on, you just do the best that you can with the path that you, that you have. And I looked at him, and he, he looked to be fairly fit. And so I said, do you climb mountains? And he said, I do. I said, when's the last time you climbed a mountain? He said, six weeks ago. I said, were you standing on the summit? He said, yes. I said, when you were standing on the summit of the mountain, could you see where all paths from the base led? And he said, no, I couldn't. I said, okay, where would you need to be what, where would you need to be standing to know that all paths from the base go to the top? And he correctly said, well, up here. I said, well, who's the only person who has that view? He said, God. I said, you're giving me this illustration because you, you think it sounds very humble and accepting, don't you? He said, yes. I said, I'm just trying to figure out which one of us thinks he's God in this room. There are all kinds of things that we may try to, to dress up, to try to somehow minimize this problem, but the problem will always, always remain. As soon as you begin to make any kinds of claims in this area, you're going to find yourself maybe um, having difficulty with some people uh, somewhere. So maybe as I just start, and because I realize this is a very sensitive question when you talk about do all paths lead to God, and... I will be answering that question uh, negatively and trying to point out something about the uniqueness of Christ, is to say that we need to learn how to engage with these questions and engage with these issues in a gentle way, in a kind way. I spent a lot of my life in other parts of the world, right across the Middle East and going right across into Asia. And so you find yourself with Islamic audiences, with Muslim audiences, with Buddhist audiences, and so on. But what I do find is interesting is when I'm in those countries speaking about Christ, at the end, the most common reaction is, gosh, this Christian gospel is radically different to what we believe. And they will immediately grant the point. However, when I'm in the West, everybody seems to be an expert in comparative religion. And the most common response will be, yes, but all of these things are basically the same. So either everybody in the West knows more about Islam than the Islamic clerics I speak to, or it may be that we're making some assumptions that we may need to look at. And so what we're going to try and do um, together now is I would like to just try to look at what is it that how the Christian faith deals with some of these questions. And I'd just like to start, if I may, by reading from the Gospel of John. I'm going to read from the beginning. Um, if you're using the Bibles in the pews, then I'm going to be reading from page 1062. And I'll be starting at chapter 1, verse 1. And then um, I'll wake you up when I get to chapter 21. <laughs> Here's how it starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing, that has made, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, just skipping down then to verse 18, where it just sums it up by saying, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. If you were to take any religious or philosophical system, you will see that it is rooted or grounded in one of three ways. You'll see that it's either rooted or grounded epistemologically in thinking, existentially in feeling, or pragmatically in doing. Let me just explain a, a bit what I mean by that. Systems which are rooted in thinking tell you that if you want to have the answer to life, the universe, and everything else, if you want to know who you are, who God is, the nature of this world and the reality around you, what you need to do is master certain ideas. And if you can master those ideas, manipulate those thoughts, learn to control them, use them, and employ them, that will put in your hands the very tools, the keys that you need to unlock the mysteries to life, the universe, and everything else. Systems which are rooted in feeling tell us that what we need to do is engage with the mystical, to reach out with our feelings, to have a, an experience, a moment in life that will somehow help define us help us understand and therefore help understand this world, the universe, this life, and everything in it. And pragmatical systems, which are rooted in doing, just simply say, look, do these things, put these principles into effect, live this way, and if you do, then all of a sudden you will have the keys that you need to understand who you are, and it will bring you to that point of salvation. It will bring you, if you like, to the mountaintop. However, the Christian faith cannot simply be reduced into one or even a combination of these three things. Now, there are some systems which try to combine all three together. So in philosophical Hinduism, for example, there are three Hindi words which can be translated right thinking, right feeling, right doing. But it is not possible to reduce the gospel into any one of these three only. It is not just the fact that Jesus, it is not the case that Jesus Christ simply into this world to ask us to accept a new set of ideas, even though there is nothing more profound than coming to know him. It is not the fact that Jesus Christ came into this world to encourage us to have certain types of feelings, even though there was nothing more thrilling than meeting the person of Christ. And it's not that he came into this world to tell us to be nice to others, to be generous, and to give our lives in service, as noble as that may be. Even when Jesus Christ himself told us that we Christians should be known and marked out by what they do. Jesus Christ did not come into this world to simply give us new thoughts about God, to give us new experiences with God, or to simply tell us to do new things for God. Because Jesus Christ came into this world as God. He claimed to reveal Christ in his very being, in his very nature. He claimed that is, that is who he is. Let me just try and flesh that out on another layer for you. Systems which are rooted in thinking are communicated to us in words. Words that are basic tools of thoughts. Words are revealed thoughts. My words reveal my thoughts to you, which is, of course, why reading God's word is so important, because it reveals his thoughts to us. But what did we just read at the beginning of the Gospel of John? We read that the word has become flesh and dwelt amongst us. A communication now not on the abstract thought of ideas, but now in the very concrete reality of the physical person of Jesus Christ, where he actually comes and makes God known to us in himself. Systems which are rooted in feeling are all looking about that moment in life, that diamondism in life, that will somehow help us understanding what all of life is about. But Jesus Christ defined life in terms of knowing him. In John 1, 4, we, we read it, that in him was life. As a matter of fact, Jesus made that even, put it in an even bolder way a few chapters later in John 3, 36, where he says, if you know me, 
you will have everlasting life. But if you do not know me, you will not see life full stop. Jesus Christ is saying here that coming to know him is not so much a moment in life. It is the moment of true life itself. Do you know that life? Have you ever received it? Having been raised a lot of my life in the, in the Middle East, I was, I was desperate for, for life. When I um, uh, was raised as a child in, um, uh, in Saudi Arabia and so on, I, I had, it was uh, quite a restrictive uh, culture. You certainly couldn't organize a meeting like this. If you organized a meeting like this, that would be a crime punishable by death. They chop your head off with an ax. It's a very effective deterrent. <laughs> they have no repeat offenders. And I grew up, therefore, hearing nothing about Jesus Christ and his claims. Now, I was desperate, however, to know life and to live life in all of its fullness. And all of you here, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you are looking for a fullness in life. And if you are sitting here today and you are not a Christian, but you have a sneaking suspicion that it may be true and that worries you slightly, it's probably because that you're worried that becoming a Christian could be a retrograde step. In other words, life would be worse as a Christian than not as a Christian. And that was certainly true for me because I was very happy with my life. And I was very fulfilled with my own life. I, I came from a loving family. They were very successful. We had money. We had power. We had uh, influence in my family. I was good at school. I was a straight-A student. I was captain of the tennis team. I was captain of the swimming team. I was captain of the chess team. I was captain of the basketball team. I... Um, I, I, was, I was a captain of the debating team. I was, uh, you know, I was popular at school, good looking, <laughs> remarkably humble as a young man. And I felt that everything was open before me. I, I was happy to experiment. I was trying to create an identity for, an identity for myself, as I'm sure many of you are. There were all kinds of things I did in that time. I can remember as a, as a teenager, I was driven. The images I had in life about what it meant to have a true, fully life was actually for me when I was 17, 18, was driven entirely by the movies. And I actually lived out what I saw in the movies because surely that's what life was about. One great actor who had a huge impact in my life and amazingly has never won an Oscar despite his great body of work, a man by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> produced all kinds of films that were attractive to me. In one of his films, it starts with him walking up a mountain, carrying a tree on his shoulder while smoking a cigar. <laughs> and since I don't have the build all inclination to carry trees, I took up cigar smoking. <laughs> Another one of my heroes was James Bond. James Bond had a silver cigarette case. I had a silver cigarette case. I used to smoke filterless French cigarettes because I could remove it from the case, flick it in the air, and as it was spinning, I could catch it in my mouth. It didn't matter which end you could catch. You could always light the other end. <laughs> now, what I'm telling you is completely true. None of this is, is made up, sadly. <laughs> my wife were here. She would be red with embarrassment right, right now. But you know on a box of matches, there's a little strip you strike a match against in order to light it. You know that little strip? I used to take that and stick it to the bottom of my shoe. So having flicked a cigarette into my mouth, I could take a match and light it like I'd seen in the movies. Now that was driven by Clint Eastwood, who for me was the epitome of all I wanted to be. There's a story told about Clint Eastwood who he was asked the question, why does everybody think you're such a cool person? And he looked at the interviewer and he produced a small cigarillo from his pocket, he put it on the edge of the table, flicked it so it started spinning in the air. While it was spinning in the air, he produced a match from his back top pocket, struck it under the table, lighting it caught the cigar in his mouth, lit it, inhaled very deeply, blew one big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big smoke ring, and said, I don't know. <laughs> All of us are trying to, to create life and to have life. And many of us fear that the life that we may have in Christ will somehow be less less than what it will be without him. And yet the message of the Christian gospel is actually quite radical. If you're sat here today and you're saying that you're happy with your life as you are, you're basically saying that you have a life to be happy with. And what the Christian gospel actually says is that actually Jesus Christ came into this world not to take bad people and make them good, 
but to take dead people and actually make them alive. Do you know that life? That's why he came. Systems which are rooted in doing are very pragmatic. They tell us to do these things and just live it in a certain way. In John 6, 28, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, teacher, what must we do to do the works God requires? They phrase a question to him in the plural. He replies in the singular, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. They say, but wait a minute, our forefathers, they ate bread from heaven, they had manna in the desert. What miracle will you perform? What will you do in order to justify yourself to us? And Jesus looked at them and said, I am the bread of life, I am. When they asked him to justify, when they asked him what to do, they were looking for a way to live. When they asked him to justify himself, they were looking for a path to truth. At one point, Jesus Christ turned to his disciples when following him got hard and said, do you want to leave me also? And they said, Master, to whom shall we turn? You have the very words of life. A way to live, a path to truth, and the words of life. In John 14, 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am. Jesus Christ sums all of the nature of all of his claims and frames it in terms of himself. This makes him unique in all of the figures amongst all of the world's great religions. Because Jesus Christ did not come to simply to offer us a system of thought or to have a certain type of experience or to tell us to do certain things. Jesus Christ came and offered us himself, that he is the way, that if you want to find God, you need to come to him. Now this is at that point, this puts Jesus Christ in a class of one. If you take Buddhism and you come to a Buddhist priest and you say, look, did it have to be the Buddha who gave us Buddhism or could it have been anyone else? They will tell you, well, no, it was the Buddha who did it, but anyone who achieved that enlightenment could have given you the system. And as a matter of fact, if you take Buddha away and you even try to argue that he didn't historically exist, you know, he did, but even if he didn't historically exist, it doesn't matter. The whole system would remain intact. What he taught would still remain behind. If you're talking with Muslims and you say, look, did God have to choose Muhammad to give him this revelation, or could it have been anyone else? They will be absolutely insistent that no, no, this was the prophet that God chose. And I'll say, yes, that's correct, but could he have chosen anyone, or did it have to be Muhammad? And the answer is, well, no, I guess it could have been anybody. In other words, you can remove Muhammad from the system, the system will still remain. But you cannot remove Christ from Christian. If you remove Christ from Christian, you're left with the letters I, A, N, and Ian cannot help you. <laughs> Jesus Christ did not simply come to offer us a new system of thought, even though there is nothing more, I say, profound than knowing him. He did not just simply come to give us a new kind of ex mystical experience, even though there's nothing more thrilling than meeting him. Jesus Christ did not come to tell us about God. Jesus Christ claimed that he came as God. That's why in 2 Timothy 1.12 we read, not that I know what I have believed and I am convinced, but I know whom I have believed and I am convinced. Now this is why Christian theology is dressed up in certain words that I'd like to try to unpack for you as we just look at the fact that how the Christian faith is rooted, not just simply by reducing it into thinking, feeling, or doing, but into being. As a matter of fact, I think I'd be so bold as to say that you can look at any historical perversion of the gospel and see that it's come about because people have reduced it simply into a set of ideas to be mastered, or a certain type of experience that you have, or a list of do's and don'ts that you obey. And all the time missing out the central person in the middle of it all, the person of Christ, who is God. That's why within the Christian faith we talk about incarnation. Jesus Christ comes as God. We read in John 1 that through him all things were made. In the book of Genesis in chapter 1, we're told that God speaks. And as a wrote of that spoken word, existence comes. Now, what language did he speak? Do you ever think about that? Now, there are a few of you here who might think he spoke American. <laughs> but he would have spoken, obviously, the original English, as Her Majesty does speak it. <laughs> Who, just in case you're wondering, is the solution to the political nightmare you're currently looking at. <laughs> what language should he speak? Every time you speak, you reveal something of yourself. Words are revealed thoughts. If I speak clearly and I communicate clearly, you understand exactly what I'm thinking and you also learn something about who I am. When God speaks, do you think he speaks poorly? 
As God speaks, he reveals himself completely. What was the word he spoke? In the beginning was the word, and the word was God and was with God. And, the, and was with God, and the word was God. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing has been made that was made. Jesus Christ is that word through whom all things were made. And now we have this revelation of God himself, not in the abstract of thought, but in the flesh and blood of the person of Jesus Christ. That's why in John 14, 5, Jesus said, if you know me, you would know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And one of the the disciples said, Jesus, look, show us the Father, show us God, that will be sufficient for us. And Jesus looks at him and says, have I been with you all of this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He's saying, if you have seen me, you have seen God. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? He is in his very nature, God. None of the other great founders of the other world's religions claims to be God. They say that they come to show a way, to teach a way, to reveal a way, but not to be the way. Jesus Christ said you have to come to him if you want streams of living water. In that sense, he has no peers, he has no competitors, and he has no equals. The Christian faith is rooted in being in terms of its salvation. It is through Christ's physical death and bodily resurrection that we are saved. At the cross, as Jesus Christ goes to the cross, he takes on into his body everything that's gone wrong in ours. Every wrong thought, every harmful experience, every bad thing that we have done, and all of the consequences that flow from those things and all of the punishment it deserves, all of that he takes on into himself. Which is why the Bible says he has become a curse for us. Jesus Christ has become sin for us. We read it in our, the, other, the first reading we had up there from 2 Corinthians, that God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. This is a very powerful statement. It is saying that everything that has gone wrong in our being, Christ has taken on into himself and all of the consequences of that, and he pays and he deals with that on the cross, and he conquers over it through his resurrection. He is raised to new life, and he offers us that new life in him. Do you know that hope, that living hope that comes as a result of receiving that kind of life? That's why we talk about transformation. We read it again in that, that first reading in 2 Corinthians 15. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We read it in John chapter 3, where Jesus Christ says, if you want to see God, if you want to be with God, you must be born again. Literally, you have to become a new kind of creation. Have you ever received that? To become a Christian is not simply to give intellectual assent to a set of ideas. It is not simply to have a certain type of experience. It is not to promise to lead this noble life. To become a Christian is to welcome the person of Christ and know a transformation of your very being. Because the problem that we face is not primarily that we have insufficient knowledge, a too low a moral standard, or that we haven't had enough of certain types of experience. The problem that we face, the most fundamental problem we face is of a very essential nature, which is why when as a human race we ask the question, who are we, we're often scared with the answers that we get. Because essential answers, who am I, demands, and sorry, an essential question, who am I, demands an essential answer. And the trouble is, is that we look inside, we're often troubled by what we see. I don't know if you've ever read any of Mary Shelley's books, the great atheist uh, writer who rejected her Christian faith very early on. But in one of her books, Frankenstein, she makes a very startling observation. Now, just in case you've seen the films and you're confused, you need to understand that in the book, Frankenstein is a doctor who creates this benign, powerful being that is also slightly ugly. Or actually, more than slightly ugly. And he gives, this being comes to life. And when it is first created, it is good-natured, it is kind, it is gentle. 
But as this being observes more and more human behavior, and as he reads human history, human philosophy, observes human behavior, he becomes increasingly cynical, increasingly cruel, cruel and increasingly violent. Later on in the book, the monster creates Dr. Frankenstein because it is now has literally become a monster and they have to termin they're looking to see how they can kill it to terminate it. And the monster looks at his creator, Dr. Frankenstein, and says, when I first came into this world and I looked at the human race, they seemed to be everything that could be considered godlike. He said to be a human seemed at one point to be the most noble thing that you could be. But as I looked at how you treat other people, as I read of your history, as I've seen what you've done, my admiration ceased and I turned away, he said, in disgust and loathing. He says, to be a human at one point seems to be everything that can be considered all good and godlike, and at the same time, you seem to be so vicious and base. How can I reconcile, the monster says, these two parts to human nature? All I can conclude, the monster says, and remember this is from the pen of an atheist, all I can conclude is that you were created in the image of something which is perfect, and you've fallen away from it. I, however, the monster says, have been created in the image of something which is imperfect, and I have fallen away from that. Most of us are not happy with who we are. That is why if you go into a bookshelf, you'll see them littered with self-help books, all promising change. And they all tell you, look, you're over here, you're not happy with who you are, but if you change the way you think, if you change the way you feel, if you change the patterns of behavior in life, you can become the person you've always wanted to be. There's a path from A to B, and they have a myriad of paths to get you from one to another. But Jesus Christ's radical comment is that there is no path from A to B. Instead, there is a huge gulf between those two. There's no way to get from one to another. And what Jesus Christ comes is he claims to come and deal with that inner corruption that we, see, we feel and we live with every day. I don't know if you're familiar with Oliver Sacks, the great neuropsychologist who studied at Oxford and then came over to take up a chair here. He wrote many books, one of them's called Awakenings, and that particular one was also made into a film with Robert De Niro. But if you read that book around page 26 or so, you'll see that Oliver Sacks, he makes a very interesting comment, and this is one of the world's leading neuropsychologists. He says this, all of us have a basic intuitive feeling that once we were whole and well, at ease, at peace, at home in this world, totally united with the grounds of our being, and that somehow we lost this primal, happy, innocent state and fell into our sickness and suffering. We had something of infinite preciousness and beauty, and we've lost it. We spend the rest of our lives searching for that which we have lost, hoping one day we will suddenly find it. How do you like that? A hundred years of psychological research, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, we finally got as far as Genesis chapter three. <laughs> this is the problem that Jesus Christ claims he comes to speak into. Not just simply to reprogram our minds or our emotions or wipe out, just change our patterns of behavior when we become a Christian, he offers to change the very frame of our being. He claims that he can move us from darkness into light, that he can move us from death into life, that he can take a fallen and broken life and he can make it new and breathe new life into it. That is what it means to be a Christian. If you are here today and you've always thought of being a Christian as being nothing more than believing certain ideas, trying to do certain things, or having certain types of experience, but you have never met Christ and had that new life from him, you need to understand you still haven't entered into the reality of what it means to be a Christian. Because Christianity is not a state of mind, it's a state of existence. Do you know that new life in him? That is why he came. And this is the hope that God offers everybody. That he is able to deal with this foundational problem which is right at the center of the human heart and of human existence. When I uh, finish from here today, I will uh, have some lunch and then I'll go to Colorado Springs Airport and then I'll get to Denver Airport and I have a two and a half hour lay over there before flying home. And I'll be picking up the phone while I'm there to speak to a very good friend of mine who's also something of a mentor to me by the name of Tom Terrence. Now when I tell this story, some of you may Google Tom Terrence because you may want to read about his life. Do not believe everything you read on the internet about him. He did not assassinate Martin Luther King or JFK, even though there are websites out there claiming both. But it is true to say that he was one of the most successful internal terrorists in North American history. 
So successful that a man called Edgar Hoover, when he was the joint head of the CIA and FBI, put him on America's 10 most wanted list by the time he was 21 years old. That's what you call success at an early age. Tom Tarrant was a good Southern Baptist. He felt he had his ticket punched and he was going to heaven. He'd come to the front of church when he was 12, so, and someone had prayed for him, and he'd, he'd had that experience, and so surely he was going. And in his head and his heart, he would say that he believed all the right things. He got a little disappointed and upset when his school was the first school in the United States of America to be desegregated, and they bust kids in from another neighborhood. Now, Tom Terrence was upset about this, but he wasn't upset about this in the way that the normal members of the Ku Klux Klan were upset, the KKK, because Tom Terrence felt that the KKK were liberals. <laughs> they were unhappy about it, but they weren't really doing anything about it, or not, they weren't doing enough. So he joined an organization called the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And then he gave himself over to a life of terror which was absolutely horrendous in everything it stood for and everything it achieved. His reign of terror became so big that Edgar Hoover eventually decided he had to have him killed. So he arranged to have the um, undercover agents who had been trained to infiltrate enemy agent groups around the world, and some of them operating in the UN. He took, Edgar Hoover took that group who'd been trained in covert ops and how to infiltrate other organizations. He pulled them out of the situations they were in, sent them to go and find Tom Terrence's organization, infiltrate it, and have him killed. Now, this was a fairly controversial operation. As far as I'm aware, the CIA should not be assassinating American citizens on American soil. But I guess at times people feel that difficult things justify that kind of behavior, and I'd just like to say, if the CIA are listening, how much I admire and respect your work. <laughs> Well, a crack troop like that were very successful. They infiltrated his group. They found where he was. They set up an operation to have him killed. And one night at 2 a.m., as he slowly walked up to a Jewish businessman's house with a bomb in his hands, a team of 26 men who'd been appointed, put on roofs and various other houses around the target they knew he was coming to, opened fire. Well, somehow he made it back into his car which does, I may suggest, imply that some of these men needed additional training. <laughs> As he got into the car, his accomplice, who was a young female primary school teacher, she took a bullet in his, her neck. She fell into his lap. She was dead about 30 seconds later. As he sped away, they'd hidden cars in the garages around the neighboring, in the neighboring properties, and as he drove away, they drove after him, and they opened fire. Now, if memory serves me correctly, I think 367 rounds of ammunition were fired, which I guess is a testimony to American engineering. <laughs> Eventually, his car came to a standstill. As he came out of his car, he picked up the machine, the Uzi that was next to him, the small machine, and as he came out of the car, he sprayed the car behind him with bullets. The guy who masterminded the operation, when he read of his report, said that Tom was one of the best shots he'd ever seen. Apparently, he could hit a quart of milk at 250 or maybe even 400 yards with the machine gun. Apparently, it's quite hard. And if any of you would like to try this later, I'm game. <laughs> well, as he did that, coming out of the car behind him were two men. The first one saw what was happening. He ducked behind the door. The bullets, the gun was passed as he sprayed behind him. But the second guy was turning. He couldn't do anything. He took a bullet straight into the heart. And when the clip emptied, the first man shot Tom twice with a shotgun in the leg. And then instead of coming to finish him off, as were his orders, he went to his partner and actually got his heart beating again and saved his life. And in that brief moment of confusion, Tom escaped. But they came with dogs and they came with flashlights. They hunted him down. They found where he was. And when they found where he was, cowering in a bush, bleeding badly, they opened fire at almost point-blank range. When they turned their flashlights back on, he was still breathing. And at this point, one of the men produced a gun and held it to his head to finish him off. And at this point, an ambulance crew arrived. Now, everyone was convinced he was going to die. Well, since I'm talking to him this afternoon, he didn't die. He recovered. The whole thing went to trial. You can read about it in the press. There was a big scandal about it. Tom Terrence, however, was convicted. He was sent to a maximum security prison in Alabama. After six months there, he decided he didn't like the accommodation the government had provided him, so he got together with some friends and he left. 
he rejoined his old unit not knowing it had been infiltrated by the CIA. His position was betrayed. There was an enormous firefight in which most of his colleagues were killed. He was recaptured and put in solitary confinement. Edgar Hoover recommended he should serve every single day of the rest of his sentence in solitary. But while he was there, all he could do was read. After he'd finished reading Mein Kampf and various other Third Reich literature, as a good Southern Baptist, he thought maybe he should try reading the Bible. And as he was reading through the gospel, he got to the statement where it says, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his very soul? And he realized at that point for the first time in his life that he was a sinner. You see, the word sin in the Christian faith doesn't simply describe something we do which is, which is wrong. It describes who we are. Something has gone wrong within us. He got down on his knees and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. The change and transformation in his life was so obvious and so profound that Edgar Hoover heard about it. Now, if you know your civil rights history, you'll actually know that Edgar Hoover heard about most things those days. <laughs> he sent the man who masterminded that entire operation to go to Tom Terrence, interview him, and see what on earth had happened. That man went to write on his own book. In it, he states that from the moment he entered the cell, he knew that he was looking at a totally different man. So profound was the change in Tom Terrence's life that two months later, he himself gave his own life to Christ. While Tom was in prison, he wrote to the 26 men who'd been appointed to shoot him that day, apologizing that he'd put their lives in danger and telling about his newfound hope in Christ and asking if he could meet with them. 22 of them agreed and 21 of them became Christians. The Jewish community, when they encountered Tom and went to visit him in prison, were so struck by what he had said that the man whose home Tom had tried to blow up petitioned the government and set forward a plan which ended up in his early release. And when Tom was released from prison, he began, he hooked up with, with someone else who'd also been involved in something very similar. And they began to tour up and down the length and breadth of North America talking about how wrong he had been and of his newfound life in Jesus Christ. We live in a world where we feel we're bereft of hope. But there is one only and only one great hope in this world. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. He did not come to tell us about God. He is God. God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Because only he can change the human heart. Do you know that change in your life? Is being a Christian to you nothing more than having a certain set of ideals, trying to do certain things, coming to church however boring it may be? You need to understand that God loves you. And he's given himself on a death, to death on a cross for you. And he invites all of you to receive this new life from him. Do you need to receive it? Is it possible that you're sat here this day and even though that, that, that new life was once yours, you've now fallen into patterns of behavior, so much so that this new life that you actually once had in Christ is now hidden from public view and can no longer be seen by anyone? Well, the incredible news, the amazing good news is that God loves each one of us. He himself came into this world. He took on the sin of the world. He paid for the sin of the world. He conquered over it. And he comes to each one of us and he offers us new life in him. And the way in which we receive it is through a process of repentance and faith. Repentance is simply saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is not, by the way, saying, I'm sorry if I hurt you. That's how most husbands apologize to their wives. What it means is, I'm sorry I hurt you, which means I'm now feeling sorry for myself that you feel sorry for yourself. Life was easier a couple of minutes ago before I did whatever it is what I, I shouldn't have done. And I'm feeling sorry for myself. This is not repentance, this is regret. True repentance is simply saying I was wrong. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Faith is turning to a God who is there, who's made a provision for you and saying, I'm now gonna trust in you and your promise of new life. I'm not, I can't save myself, but I wanna receive the salvation that you've won for me, and I need to be new in you. And if that's you this day, I'd like to be able to offer to pray for you as we wrap up this time. And so I'm gonna ask you if you would just bow your heads for a moment. And if you would like to pray with me, I'll ask you to raise your hand. If you are new here, 
and you've never been here before and you're worried about doing this, just put your hand on your wallet. If you're feeling nervous, we live in a fallen and depraved world. You have no idea who sat next to you. Now, please don't do this if you're not sure. If you're still processing this through and you're thinking about it, keep coming back here, ask your difficult questions. Matt's about to start a great series that will just continue to look at the consequences of what it would mean if the gospel is true. Come and ask your questions. But if you are here and you feel like you're in the very grip of God himself, he's put his finger on your heart and on your life and said, I'm calling you today. This is for you. And you know that you need to pray and receive him. Then I'll just ask you just to raise your hand, whichever auditorium you're in, just as a way of saying, Lord, I need this prayer for me. Yes, okay, I can, I can see here uh, several people. Well, I'm gonna pray this. And if you know this is for you, just raise your hand and this is a simple prayer of repentance and faith before God. Dear Father, thank you that you love us. We want to thank you that you have stepped into a world that has turned its back on you. And Father, we're sorry for what we have done. Lord, for our part in this, for where we have failed. And Lord, we just say sorry before you. Father, we want to thank you for Christ. We thank you that he came into this world. And on the cross, our sin became his sin. And his righteousness and goodness became ours. Lord, we want to receive that forgiveness that comes from you. Lord, that new life that flows from you. Lord, we pray that you may fill us and dwell within us richly. That our lives may now reflect you. Lord, help us to follow you whatever the cost. And Lord, we pray all of this in Christ's precious name. Amen.